E aí? Listening to me, please say hi. Hello. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Oi, oi. Just a, just a minute. No problem. Uh, boa tarde, pessoal. Uh, eu não sei se vocês viram já no, nas nossas redes sociais, mas o Chris, que ele seria o palestrante agora dessa atividade. Ele teve um problema na hora de vir aqui para o Brasil, lá em Seattle, e eles enfrentaram uma nevasca e, por isso, ele não conseguiu chegar aqui no Brasil. Eles perderam o voo deles lá nos Estados Unidos e não conseguiram vir aqui para o Brasil. Certo? Então, por isso, a gente vai fazer uma chamada aqui rapidinha com ele, de cinco minutos, para ele falar um pouquinho sobre o projeto dele, para que vocês possam conhecer também. E, logo em seguida, a gente vai ter uma palestra com uma nova magistral, que é a Sharon McPherson, que ela é bem legal também e já está aqui com a gente e é isso, certo? Então, é, o Chris vai se apresentar aqui para vocês e logo em seguida a gente começa. For, uh, I think five minutes for me to talk. Um, obviously, I wish I could be there from the largest snowstorm in 50 years in Seattle where we don't have snow. But uh, I've got five minutes and I'm not going to waste a single one. So... The story of the Million Waves project was simple. It was just an idea. I've been reading all about this ocean plastic, and I just thought of a way where we could take something pretty terrible and turn it into something useful. But that's all it was. It was an idea. I had zero experience in 3D printing. I had no idea how to recycle anything. I didn't even recycle anything myself in my house. I'm just a normal person. But it was a good idea. And the more we showed it to people, the more things got started. And after a while, it was pretty much unstoppable. Now, the, the number one reason I was excited to come down to Brazil was it's a pretty big world out there. In the United States, Europe, Australia, everyone's been involved in this project, but there's been no louder voice and there's been no more people actually doing something than the people in Brazil. And that's what it comes down to. It comes down to action. Good ideas are meaningless unless people get involved. And Brazil has done that more than anyone in the world. And I know that there's no way you could have known that. So I needed to tell you that it's different. When we look at the problems in the world, when we look at things that are happening in the ocean or whether it's with governments or the environment or whatever it is, you feel really small, really fast. And the number one reason that this is important is nobody's coming to save us. It's going to take all of us. When I looked at the different speakers that had spoken to this group, there were some powerful people in the past. You've heard some of the biggest voices, you've heard from some of the, the biggest names that are out there. But here's the thing, I'm nobody, but you're nobody too. And it's the people like us that are actually going to change everything because we can and we've got nothing to lose. When you look, about, when you look at business, when you look at ideas, All the competition's in the middle. Everyone's going for the same thing. They're fighting over the same resources and the same ideas. It's very lonely at the edges. When we looked at the plastic that was in the oceans, it's easy to see that, that it's a problem, that you want it to go away. But when you change your perspective and you start seeing it as a resource, resources have value. So we were able to take this resource and turn it into something positive. But the bigger vision Is, is much more grandiose and it's much more powerful. We're, get, we're developing the technologies now to where you can take this plastic and develop it into much more than the, than the 3D printed limbs that we're doing so far. Now, I love these because I love helping children. I love helping adults. I love helping anybody who needs help. But more than that, how do you take this resource and develop a micro economy anywhere? What I'm proud to announce, and Elaine is there to give you more information, What we want to do is actually build a small facility in Brazil where people can gather the plastics from the beaches. They can gather these things that are problems and turn them into solutions to where they can bring them there, process it fully into 3D, into 3D filament and produce things that they can use, things that they can build with, things that they can sell and, again, develop their own revenues. Because this is the key, people. This is the key. Again, nobody's coming to save us and dig us out of whatever situation that we're in. 
But if we can take these resources, turn them into revenues, now we've got power. And the more people that are doing this, the further that we can get. So with this facility, when you guys have time, please speak to Elena. And my message to you is always stay hungry. When it looks at risk in life, there are there's an easier path always. You know, we could all just sit in a hot tub all day drinking margaritas, but nothing's going to change. But when you get involved, the one thing I want you to know is that you are part of it. So as we build this small facility in Brazil, anybody and everybody who's part of it, your name will be on that wall for the rest of your life. Say, we didn't wait for somebody powerful. We didn't wait for the government. We didn't wait for anybody. We did something. We stood up and we took action because if we didn't, nobody else was going to. And your name will be there. Your name is the most important thing in the world. It's the one thing that nobody can ever take from you. And we're going to attach it to something big. We're going to attach it to something powerful. And one of those things that breaks my heart is I had a wonderful presentation planned. I had so much to share with you. And I'm going to record it in its entirety and make sure that uh, it's available to you to watch. Because um, we've got some big plans and I only had five minutes. But my remaining thought is I want you to remember in the entire world, Nobody did more and is doing more than Brazil. I want the world to know that. And I want to be so far in first, there is no second. And Brazil will always lead this charge. Because you've already demonstrated that you can do it. And I'm here to make it possible. So I, I apologize that uh, I couldn't be there. It's, it's absolutely killing me. But uh, I'm very glad we at least got to spend a little bit of time together. So again, look into the Million Waves Project. And I can't tell you, the future's holding big things for everybody in this room. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so, uh, pessoal, então, aqui, como representante do, do projeto, a gente tem a Alana, que ela está aqui na lateral do palco, certo? É, a Alana ela é brasileira, ela mora aqui é, em Natal, e quem tiver mais dúvidas sobre o projeto, vocês con podem contactar a Alana, aquela pessoa ali na lateral. E ela vai falar com vocês, vai tirar dúvida de vocês sobre o projeto, vai falar como vocês podem também ser parte do projeto, tá certo? Então, qualquer dúvida que vocês tiverem, procurem a nossa amiga Alana, certo? Então, agora, sem mais delongas, né, a gente vai chamar a nossa é, magistral. A Sharon, ela já esteve aqui com a gente várias vezes. She's, a, é, she's there, ok? Sharon. She's an amazing person. É, she was here with us last year, so if you could... Uh, check what she did already, it, she's amazing. And she's going to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, how you can apply that to higher education. Okay, so please, uh, just a minute. Okay, so guys, please, let's uh, welcome Mrs. Cheryl McPherson with a round of applause, please. So again, Sharon, come, you can come. Hi. <laughs> okay. Hello, campus party. Tudo <laughs> bom? All right. So uh, I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, that it's really, as always, an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I was planning to be where you are, looking at Chris. Um, so uh, when Thales asked if I could speak to you, I said, of course I can speak to you, because that's why I travel from South Africa, to be here with you. So um, thank you for having me. Um, and so during my talk today, I'm actually going to pick up on some things that Chris was talking about. Because one of the reasons why I keep coming back to Brazil is because you are amazing. Give yourselves a round of applause for being amazing. <laughs> um, so one of the things I'm always talking about um, is some of the amazing work that we're doing in South Africa. And I talk a lot about bridges because I'm always interested in building bridges between Brazil and Africa. 
And so today, for the first time, I'm actually going to talk about some of the stuff that my own Center for Disruptive Technologies is doing, which is investing in amazing people like you. Um, and we are leveraging the power of artificial intelligence to transform uh, secondary as well as tertiary education. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But I'd like to first start off with the video that I think sets the tone for my talk today. So here we go. The, f the first, um, yep. So that sets the tone for what I want to talk to you about today. Um, and I mentioned the fact that, uh, where am I pointing this? I mentioned the fact that um, I have a center for disruptive technologies, um, but I also teach. So I am uh, a teacher at the University of Cape Town's Graduate School of Business, and one of the things that um, I do when I teach is I take into consideration the fact that you are the most important thing that we could be investing in. So I try to build bridges between higher education and technology because everything that's happening in this space is happening because of knowledge being shared. And one of the things that I think is the most important thing that I can do today in this talk with you is to inspire you to invest in education. Um, Chris talked about the fact that Brazilians are at the vanguard of so many breakthroughs in technology, and I believe that I experienced that. We're experiencing that here. One of the things that I think we don't spend enough time thinking about and talking about is how do we leverage technology as an enabler to actually invest in education so that you can make sure that the people who are coming behind you are educated in a way that is relevant for what we need to be doing to change the world in the 21st century. And I don't believe that our educational institutions are doing that well enough. I think our educational institutions are still preparing people to work in factories and in, on farms. They're not preparing you for this world. And so part of what I invest in is the transformation of education. So in this talk, I want to do a couple of things. I want to share some knowledge with you about what, uh, what the state of education is. I want to talk to you about what I think are some of the technologies that are going to be transforming education, not just here in Brazil, but in other parts of the world. And then I want to inspire you 
to leave this place and do something about the status quo. Is that okay? Okay. So I thought, you know, before I just jump into like what it is that we're actually doing in Africa, I wanted to make sure that for those of us who are not experts in artificial intelligence, that um, we just take a second so that we are all on the same page with respect to artificial intelligence, right? Um, because so often we talk about these things, but we haven't actually agreed on what they really mean. So we're investing in artificial intelligence that's gonna transform education across the world. And we're starting in Africa. Um, so as you know, one of the things that's happening is technologies are converging. So you have artificial intelligence, which is converging with a number of technologies. And when we look at the possibilities, for example, with artificial intelligence and quantum computing, um, the possibilities are endless. And I'm gonna share with you some of the things that are happening in that area as well. Um, so what I wanted to do, in case you can't, um, I, want, I don't want to make noise on this thing, but um, what I wanted to do was to make sure that I give you an opportunity to get on the same page with me about what it is that I'm talking about when I'm talking about artificial intelligence. And I always think that for those of us who think we're really smart, how do we take these complex ideas and break them down into something that a person who isn't an expert can actually get their minds around. So, you know, I think of artificial intelligence as being our capacity um, to build neural networks using computers to, that simulate the way that your brain actually works, right? That's a quick and easy way for those of us who are not, are not specialists in AI to think about AI. And then I think about things like robotics as being AI plus things that move. Um, so, I also wanted to make sure that you understood the difference between artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and deep machine learning. Because when we look at what's gonna be happening with the transformation of education, not just in Africa, but across the world, including Brazil, what's really driving it is not just artificial intelligence. It's artificial intelligence coupled with computing power that is enhancing our ability um, to, uh, to build machines that are capable of learning deeply, being able to access billions and sometimes trillions of data points in ways that enable personalized learning that is far superior to anything that I could do as a teacher. Do we have any teachers, educators in the audience? A couple, all right. Um, so we need more. There's nothing you could be doing that's more important than investing in education because that's investing really in the future. Um, so when we talk about what we're doing in, in South Africa, we're in the area of using deep machine learning to um, accelerate how you are learning as a student, but also our capacity to understand where we should be spending our time in the classroom, who needs help, who's actually mastering. And, and this is really important because one of the things we don't talk about as educators is we don't talk about the fact that the education system that every single person in this room has gone through is an education system that was developed really in the sixth century. So we're using educational systems that were developed in the sixth century to try to prepare people for, and so the teachers are going, <laughs> right, it makes no sense, right? So we're trying to use these really, really old ways of learning to prepare people for life in the 21st century, and it makes no sense, right? And so when I look at what's happening across the African continent, and also the same is happening across South America, I'm like, this is an excellent opportunity to actually invest in. Because we have all these young people like yourselves, you're hungry, you wanna do things, you wanna change the world, and then we have these educational systems that are way over here. And so, this is a huge opportunity for investment. So the next time I come and I ask you, who's the teacher, who's involved in like education, I want like everybody to be doing like this, okay? All right, so 
Deep machine learning, I think you got it. That's the area where we're in. I'll go like this for those who want to like take a picture. I see some of you wanted to take a picture. Um, I'm going to upload the slides on SlideShare, by the way, so that you can, you can actually access them. And then for some of you who've heard me speak before, I like to always start here. So now that we've got a sense of what we're talking about with respect to artificial intelligence, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with respect to what does she mean when she's talking about exponentially growing technologies? Because so often we're talking about disruptive tech, we're talking about exponentially growing technologies, and we actually don't understand what do you really mean. Not every technology is disruptive. Just because something makes a change in the market does not mean that that market is disrupted. So let's lose all this language that we don't know, and let's come to what we really do know. What we do know is that Technologies are advancing at a rate that is faster than any other time in the history of humankind. And I want you to be asking yourself, what are you going to be doing with that technology to make the world a better place? I've chosen education because I believe I can get exponential impact, but don't just come to campus party and have a good time and focus on what it is that you're building. Think about where are we going with exponentially growing technology? Where are you going to be in this future? And what's your legacy? When you're not here anymore, where is your name going to be on the wall in all of this? So one of the things that's most important, I think, about this slide is if you look over here to, um, to, like the, to, to your left, what you'll see is that Technologies are converging. So if you think about the 3D printer, right, the 3D printer is a convergence of other technologies. So what's continuing to happen is those technologies are converging in a way that is accelerating the pace of change. In the black, what we have is a new economic paradigm that's emerging. And why I think education is so important is because that new economic paradigm is going to change a lot of things. And if we're not ourselves prepared for what that new economic paradigm looks like, then we're gonna find ourselves on the wrong side of the digital divide. And I don't want that to happen to any of us. And so how many of you have heard about the six Ds of disruption? Peter Diamandes, let me see. Yeah, so a few of you. And so, um, in addition to teaching at the University of Cape Town, I teach at Singular, well, I'm a member of the faculty of Singularity University. I helped to bring them to South Africa. And one of the things that uh, I think stuck most with me um, when I was at Singularity University, I did the Global Studies program, was listening to Peter Diamandis, who's one of the founders of Singularity University, talk about the 60s of disruption. And his point, I think, is that by the time something truly is disruptive, it's too late for you to respond because it's deceptive. So think about your cell phone, when you're self, think about the camera, you've heard about the Kodak and the camera and the digital camera and how Kodak actually created the digital camera but then didn't do anything with it and then obviously now everybody sitting here has a digital camera that you didn't pay for. It's a series of zeros and ones, it's in your phone. I don't know if you're old enough, do you remember when people used to walk around with the camera Right? No one does that anymore. And so that's what these six Ds are talking about. So by the time something becomes a series of zeros and ones and it's an app in your phone, you know, it's over. It's become democratized. It's demonetized. You don't pay for it anymore. But it started with it being deceptive. And then it became disruptive. And then Kodak found itself not in a good place financially because the technology was disruptive. Now this was really a disruptive technology and when you think about disruptive tech, just remember the example with Kodak and your cell phone. Now that's important because if I don't get you to stay with me on this journey through this to where we are today and what we're doing, then you're gonna find yourself over here like that little guy. And that's not where you want to be. So as you're experiencing campus party and as you're thinking about where am I going in my future, remember you can't use linear models 
for trying to predict what's going to happen in exponential time, right? So you can't run the, the models that helped you to get here today to sitting in these seats. You can't use that way of thinking in this new economic paradigm because otherwise you're going to end up over there, all right? And so for those of you who don't take what I'm saying about disruptive tech seriously, this is a periodic table that was put together by um, the Imperial London College on the number of disruptive technologies that are happening. I know some of you can't read this from where you are, but I want you to get online, you can Google it, um, and some of these are quite funny, and some of them are actually quite scary. And so I don't want to create technology anxiety, I want to impress upon you the rate at which things are actually changing in the world of technology. And so can I have this video play, just a clip for me please? Now, sorry, I want this one to play, and I'm not sure how to make that happen. So can we do it from back there? Hello, hello, hello. Somebody help me. Um, how many of you have seen The Matrix? <laughs> Almost all of you. Uh, you might, in case, my, in case my, my video doesn't play properly, this is the clip where Neo is talking to Trinity and they're asking about, uh, she's asking about uh, the download for, run, for how to fly the helicopter. And then what I was gonna share with you is the next clip. Here we Can go. You fly that thing? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Let's go. Uh, I love her. She's so hot. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, so I'm going to play you a quick clip to show you what's happening in the real world. Again. Okay. What if becoming an expert pilot were as simple as putting on a cap? So our system is one of the first of its kind. It's a brain stimulation system. Uh, it sounds kind of sci-fi, but there's large scientific basis for uh, the development of our system. The specific task we were looking at is piloting an aircraft, which requires a synergy of both cognitive and motor performance. When you learn something, your brain physically changes. Connections are made and strengthened in a process called neuroplasticity. And it turns out that certain functions of the brain, like speech and memory, are located within very specific regions of the brain, about the size of your pinky. What our system does is actually target those changes to specific regions in the brain as you learn. The method itself is actually quite old. In fact, the ancient Egyptians 4,000 years ago used electric fish to stimulate and reduce pain in certain areas of their head. Even Ben Franklin applied currents to his head, but the rigorous uh, scientific investigation of these methods uh, really started in about the early 2000s. And we're building off that research to target and personalize the stimulation in the most effective way possible. Your brain is gonna be very different than my brain when we perform a task. And what we found is that in specific circumstances, the brain stimulation seems to be particularly effective at actually improving learning. One of the aspects of learning we're most interested in is how the expert brain functions. Part of what we wanted to do when we invited expert pilots to perform our experiment with us was that we wanted to better understand what their brains look like as they're performing this very particular training that we've set up. We were hoping to modulate the brains of novice pilots who had never seen this task before in order to try to make their brain states uh, more similar to the experts. What that means is essentially we were able to take a group of individuals and train them to a similar level than we could without the brain stimulation. The method employed of brain stimulation relies on actual physical contact with the scalp. 
a head cap through conductive gel to apply the currents to the, the skin or the scalp of the head. Okay, so I think you get the point. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're investing in technologies. I talked about AI and deep machine learning, but one of the things that we're exploring is neuroplasticity and how we can actually build on some of the amazing research that's happening in Silicon Valley to fast forward and um, to take situations where you actually may have people who don't have access to textbooks who don't have access to a lot of things that we have access to here, but the future of learning is, is already beyond textbooks. It's already beyond actually looking at a computer screen and saying, okay, I'm gonna use AI to learn this. The future of learning is already what we're talking about when we look at neuroplasticity and the capacity that we have today to take learning around how the expert brain functions and then through, you know, for those of us who really are not into this kind of stuff, you think of things that look like an EKG machine, but it's actually using electricity to stimulate that part of the brain that would be learning in a similar way that an expert pilot would be learning. And then, you know, after a certain period of time of this kind of stimulation, You've learned because it's gone right into your brain without all of the ways that you normally have to learn, which is by reading something, repeating, experimenting. That is game-changing technology. And so one of the things that we're gonna be continuing to explore is how do we leverage the capacity of exponentially growing technologies to make life better for people on planet Earth. So my, my goal is to positively impact a billion people investing in this technology in some of the places where people don't have access to just the basic things and enabling them to leapfrog and instead of being the last to be the first. Um, and so that's the groundwork I wanted to lay so that we're all on the same page when you understand what kind of technology we're investing in um, in South Africa and in other places on the continent. And then this part of the talk, I wanted to briefly expose you to what's happening in your educational institution as well as, as well as some of the educational institutions in Africa, because this is the why. The first part was the how. How are we gonna be doing some of the stuff we're doing? This part is really about the why. The why is that the world is changing, new economic paradigms are emerging, educational institutions aren't keeping up. This is the part where you get to be a little bit interactive. Based on what you're seeing here, Africa has and will continue to have more young people than any place else on the planet, okay? So we know that the future is African. I'm gonna try this one more time. Some of you may not know this, but the future is the future is African, yeah, yeah it is, right? Now here's something else that you may not know, is that the majority of people in Africa are female, all right? So now we're gonna put one and one together and we're gonna get two. The future is African and the future is female, all right? All the women in the house, give yourselves a round of applause because you are definitely gonna be the ones in the future. Sorry, we need our men, we need our partners, but you gotta get with this train because it's moving, okay? Yeah, all right, okay? And as you can see, um, Latin America has been pretty flat. And experts predict that through 2050, it's actually going to go down just a bit. Not all of this is great news because one of the reasons why the birth rates in Africa have continued to, to skyrocket is because we still have really high incidences of uh, infant mortality, et cetera, so people are still having a lot of kids as opposed to those places in the world where you have access to more advanced medicine, et cetera, where the birth rates have been declining. But the fact of the matter is, is that the future's African and the future's female. So when I look at this, and then I've got the Center for Disruptive Tech, I'm like, what am I called to do? And how am I gonna take my resources, my capital, you know, my access to amazing people like you, um, and build something that's gonna help to actually be part of the solution? Because if we don't have these people properly educated, 
how is that going to be great for Africa's future? And so this is another stat about what's happening within universities, particularly in South Africa, that I found really, really disturbing. So the, uh, the number of, of people who look like me in South Africa, which are the majority, it's going down, and it has been going down. And I'm saying, well, how can this be? The number of young people is going like this, but then the number of people who are actually graduating from university is going like that. And I'm like, what's up with that? And so there are a lot of reasons behind this slide. Um, some of them have to do, though, with the fact that our high schools, our secondary schools, are not preparing people for success in university. So they're getting into university and they can't get out. Our university system is equipped to deal with about 600,000 people. And today we have about a million people in our university system. So now to come back to you and global statistics. So then I looked at it and I said, but what do you as, as, as amazing young people really want from education? And this is some of the things that we're going to talk about right now. So what you're saying is that um, we want, I'll tell you I'll, the next slide, but we want education that prepares us for the 21st century. We want schools to think of, of us more as clients and not just as students. Um, if you look at this slide, the majority of, of schools and this is not just South Africa, this includes Brazil, are here. They're digitizing some elements of their current model, but, and they're creating some new models, but they're not thinking about the future of education in a big way. And you're young now, but you're gonna have kids. And those, there are a lot of you here who do have kids. And so you need to be thinking about this, not just for yourselves, but for your children and their children. How are we gonna be investing in education in ways that's gonna really change the models that we have, right? And just to let you know, only 6% of educational institutions, higher educational institutions, are investing in creating new digital models, right? And so, the next couple of slides is just about what is the future of higher education? What does it look like? And here, these are some of the money slides. Because if you think about this, you think about Brazil, you think about places like Africa, there are a tremendous amount, numbers, of investment opportunities. And one of the things that we're going to do when we bring you to South Africa for Campus Party is we're going to be asking you to really in get involved with hackathons that are helping us to solve some of the challenges that we have within our educational system. The future of education is going to be data driven. It already is. You're going to be going out and you're going to be saying, I'm not interested in going to Harvard or Stanford just because it's a big name. I want to know what does the data say about when I invest in that, that, that degree that I can go out and actually do what I want. And if the data doesn't support that, then you're not gonna pay for that education. And that's what's gonna continue to happen in the future. What does the future of higher education look like? It also looks like education that's just right, that's just in time. So if we go back and we think about the way we educate people today. All right, so we come up with degrees, we take an MBA. It has all these things in it that we've determined are essential for you to go out and be good in business. Let's call it an MBA degree. No one's ever asked you, what do you actually want to study? What are you going to do to make the world a better place? All right, so then we're going to take our expertise and our knowledge and our capacity, and we're going to create a program that meets your needs. How is that for education? As opposed to people who think they have all the ideas and they've got it right in terms of their understanding about what you and you and you and you should know coming up with things and then you've got to subscribe to that because that's the only choice that you have. That's not going to be the way that education is organized in the future. And you're going to be part of that change. Now you know, right? So 
it's about just right. You being able to access the knowledge and the information that's right for you so that you can go out and continue to do all the amazing things that you're doing right now. It's gonna to continue to evolve that way. Stackable credentials. It's not gonna be like, oh, I've got my degree and um, now I'm good to go and I'm gonna go out and look for a job. In the future, what we're gonna see is we're gonna see more stackable degrees and micro-credentials. It's happening, um, there's been a lot of pushback and people are saying, well, this degree, where does it come from? But in the future, you're gonna see more stackable degrees and you're gonna see micro-degrees and people saying, okay, I'm gonna go and study with these guys, I'm gonna get this micro-credential and that's gonna enable me to go and work for Microsoft because now I've got the credentials that I need, okay? So, now the last part of my talk is really intended to inspire you and to tell you specifically about what some of the stuff is that we're doing in South Africa. So I, I mentioned the fact that, um, am I, <laughs> what am I doing wrong? I mentioned the fact that um, I was uh, a member of the faculty of Singularity University. And then when I came back to South Africa, I looked around and I looked at how broken our education system was and I said, I want to invest in something that invests in young people. I want to create campuseros everywhere. I want, you, I want them to be doing amazing things. So how can, how can I, as a person with what I have, how can I do that? How can I create something that has the capacity to impact billions and billions of people? Well, education can do that because all I need is one of you to go out and to create a Google. Well, then I get some of that, that karma, right? Because <laughs> I've empowered you to go out and do something amazing. So I like to consider myself to be a person who loves to be the wind beneath somebody else's wings. I don't have to get the credit. You don't have to know about me. You don't have to know who I am. But if I can just inspire and enable other people to do amazing things, leveraging what it is that I have, then I'm happy with that. And I think probably what I'd like for you to know from that is that you don't actually have to be the Sergey or the Larry Page. You can be the person who speaks positivity and provides enablement and encouragement to other people. And they go out and they do amazing things. It doesn't have to always be about you. I'm interested in the impact. I don't care how it happens. I'm just interested in millions and millions of the poorest and the most disempowered people on the planet being able to do amazing things. That's what gets me. That's what gets me going. And I think that if you can spend some time while you're here at Campus Party, thinking about what's really meaningful to you, what do you really care about, and how you're investing, not just in your own idea that you came here to promote, but how are you taking time to support the person next to you? I think that's really important. I think that that's how we actually get it done, right? Um, so I call it Super School. I started working on it about 10 years ago. Um, we have uh, almost 8,000 schools now that are gonna be part of our program, and I am, leveraging AI and some of the technology that I've already shared with you to actually make this happen. And so I don't start off talking about that because then people would be like really scared, like, whoa, what are you doing to my kid? But I'm doing it slowly in ways that don't really disrupt the existing education system. And this is what our, um, our portal looks like. Um, we are uh, gonna be, like I said, when I bring you guys to South Africa 2020, um, South Africa, April 2020, I want you to be there. One of the things that I'm gonna be asking you all to do is to get involved with hacking our proprietary uh, platform that we're building that's incorporating AI, deep machine learning. We haven't gotten started with neuroplasticity, but we're gonna be exploring that with some of the relationships we have in Silicon Valley. So we're moving beyond like augmented reality, virtual reality, and we're going straight for the brain, right? Um, so this is one of my last videos. I just wanted to share this with you because this is how Alex this works. Is Alex. Yep. Yep. 
Alex, an artificially intelligent web-based learning and assessment system. To understand what makes Alex the most effective learning system ever created, let's look at the science behind how it works. Science developed over decades of research at top universities. Let's take a look at Sam, a ninth grader who is struggling with Algebra 1. The first thing Alex needs to do is determine Sam's knowledge state. Sam's knowledge state is everything he already knows in Algebra 1. To get a basic understanding of what goes into computing a knowledge state, let's pretend that instead of consisting of several hundreds of topics, Algebra 1 only consisted of five topics. But even with only five topics, there are 32 possible knowledge states, or combinations of these topics. Now, some of these states are so impractical that in reality, there are actually only 13 feasible knowledge states that a student could fall into. All the feasible knowledge states are organized into a learning space, a mathematical structure specifying the relationships among the knowledge states and showing which topics a student is ready to work on. To move from one knowledge state to another within the learning space, a student must learn a new topic or forget a previously learned one. So our example involved only five topics, but if we look at the full Algebra 1 course, consisting of hundreds of topics, there are over one trillion feasible knowledge states that a student could fall into. Alex can accurately and efficiently assess where each student is among these trillions of knowledge states and know their exact position at all times. This is no simple task, and it's a task that hasn't been achieved by any other program. All of this works because mathematical cognitive scientists and software engineers at Alex have spent years gathering data from millions of actual students using the program. This data allows Alex to construct all the feasible knowledge states and how they're structured together into a learning space, leading to personalized pathways to course mastery for every student, no matter where they start. It all begins with a brief individualized assessment. Wrap up. Sorry, I'm going to wrap up because I want to have time for you to ask questions and for us to, 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 to chat. So this is where we're starting. We're starting with adaptive learning. Uh, McGraw-Hill is going to be one of our partners. But like I said, one of the things that we're also doing is building a proprietary platform uh, that I'm going to open up to a hackathon because there's some things that we want to be able to do with our platform that's beyond um, Alex. This is where we want to go. It's not just about technology. It's about how do you leverage technology to really invest in the whole person? I mean, some of you here are super smart. But I mean, how do you have a conversation? Where's the empathy? Where's the capacity to connect? In order for you to be successful in the 21st century, we need the whole person, right? And so this is part of what super school is all about. I'm not going to go through all of this stuff. I'm going to upload the slides, and we'll talk about it uh, via LinkedIn, OK? Um, that's me. That's my name. And I'd love for you to be able to connect with me on LinkedIn. And I'm going to end with this, this slide. I put this up in my office because those two little guys, they really inspire me. And um, when I feel tired, when I feel like I can't do this anymore, I look at their picture and I say, you know what? I believe that they can change the world. I certainly believe that I can change the world. And I wouldn't be here talking to you if I didn't believe that you could change the world too. Thanks, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I do. I really do. Thank you. So, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna hand the mic over to you. And, you know, I don't have a lot of rules. Ask me, you know, what, what you want. Can I move here without that, without the Hello? feedback? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Sher. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thank you. So, you talked about uh, how the future looks like for learning and how it's going to be for when you're in uh, college and you're learning. So how the future looks like for when you want to get into college. I mean, taking tests the way they are today, they're kind of not, not boring, but like they don't yeah. reflect what we are today. 
So how is that happening right now in, at Singularity at other universes that, you, yeah. that you've been to? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. Thank you. Listen, one of, the, um, one of the challenges that we're having globally, I'm sure we're having the same challenge here in, in Brazil, is that where we are in terms of investors in ed tech and even you, you know, people who might be students. I, I'm, I'm always learning and I love to, to, to be a student for my whole life as well. The question is though, is how do you deal with that future when you're stuck with these like old ways of trying to assess and measure what you really know? And my answer to you is that it's going to take time because we still have a lot of interest that are invested in the status quo and in and, and maintaining the system. And I'm also not one to say that, you know, it would be good for us just to throw out the way that we're doing it overnight. I think that would really be too disruptive and it would really do more harm than good. And so I think what's gonna continue to happen is um, I'm gonna keep talking to you <laughs> and then you're gonna keep putting pressure on educational institutions and we're gonna continue to invest in what's happening in the market and it's gonna be a pull rather than a push. But I don't think it's gonna change overnight. And for the foreseeable future, we are gonna have these kind of, you know, pretty dumb standardized tests because it takes a long time. We've been living with this system for, for centuries. It's gonna take a while for it to change. But that's nothing stopping you from investing in doing something different, right? Because we need people who are outside the system who are creating pressure for the system to change. One of the things we're experiencing, for example, across South Africa, and based on my research, the same is true in Brazil, is that the cost of tertiary education is rising like this. The cost of, uh, I mean, the, the, the rate of your income is rising like that. It's not keeping up, right? So it's becoming more and more expensive every year. That's a business opportunity for you. Because the amount of people who want to learn, it's, it's increasing. But the capacity of educational institutions to actually keep up with those people who want to learn, it's not keeping pace with the market. Which is why people like me and perhaps people like you are investing in that. So we have something called the African Leadership University. Um, you know, I, I w was way back when they first started, was giving them support, and now they don't need my help anymore. They're doing amazing things. But they do those kind of programs that we're talking about. It's like, what do you want to study? Okay, well, we're going to bring the best experts in the world. We're going to put them together. We're going to create a degree for you, and here you go. It, it is perfect. And so what's stopping you from creating something like that here? Okay. I think I got time for at least one more. Anybody? Um, yeah. Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. Here. Hi. Hi, um, Ms. Cheryl. I'm okay. Peter. You got the mic. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it's very, it's really low. Can you hear me now? Oh, better. Yeah, talk up. Okay. Uh, I'm Pedro. I'm from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Okay. Uh, I have an idea for uh, an application of where you can use machine learning to provide a better support for students. Uh, where you can identify if they are having trouble using machine learning. And I wanted to know if you know other universities that have already used a system like that and if it was ef effective. So let me, I, it was a little difficult for me to hear you. Your question was, are there universities where we are effectively using sort of natural language? Um, I, not exactly. Okay. Uh, let me give you a, a few, a little bit of data. In my course, data science in my university, yeah. at least 60% of students drop out of the course because they don't have the right support to keep it. Uh, right. My idea was to create a system where we can analyze. The students are starting to go, bad, to go really bad at classes. Can we provide a better support and yeah. earlier identify that? Yeah. I wanted to know if you have you already know other places that are using a system like that and if it's actually yeah. being effective. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at, 
Okay, so when we first started off uh, building our own platform, we were like, yeah, we're gonna build our adoptive learning platform. It's amazing. And it's gonna be able to do a lot of what you talked about, right? And then one of the things that we realized was that the guys at Alex had like a 20 year head start. <laughs> we were never gonna catch them because they already had literally like billions and billions of data points that would help you as a professor identify like early on who, where those students are who are struggling so that you could begin to craft interventions to really help them. So it drastically, drastically drives down the default rate or the, the rate in which people are dropping out because you can intervene. It's personalized. Here, here's what I want you to take away. One of the things, the future of learning is personalized learning. It's not me throwing a bunch of stuff at you. It's personalized learning. It's not MOOCs, it's micro learning. And that's what Alex really is all about. And so one of the reasons why we partnered with Alex to get out of the starting blocks is because they're able to do just that. Um, so Alex is already in like, I mean, McGraw Hill is a company that's been around for like um, over a hundred years and they have a lot of resources to throw at this. And so Alex is already in, you know, hundreds of thousands of schools all over the Uni United States, but we wanted to adapt it to bring it as a basis for what we can do in Africa. The short answer to your question is yes. My center is working with a number of universities in South Africa and in other parts of Africa to take uh, Alex as a base platform to build on that, some of its proprietary to the university so that they can use what is really adaptive learning in engineering, computer science, and a number of other um, courses that are happening on the tertiary. So we can talk more about it. It is happening. So I think I'm out of time. I'm gonna get out of here, but I'm gonna hang out over here somewhere and you can feel free to keep the conversation going. You've been awesome, as always. I love you, and I'm sorry I'm not Chris, but hey, this is what you got. Thank you, thanks. Cheers, guys. Thank you.